All right, let's do this again. Now, I know you're thinking, again, we didn't do this before. Well, I did. And uh, this is the, the section 2. Point, let's just go right to the thing. This is section 2.2.2, which I didn't write, so I'll do that now. And basically, we are covering uh, the rest of the stuff from the section. So all this stuff here, and we're going to cover all of this. And I know we have time because I already recorded it, uh, but you may have seen my, my YouTube short. As I was recording, I didn't realize that a recent upgrade to OBS uh, reactivated a secondary microphone. So this is uh, what the recording ended up like. If you if you were to just edit the file, I mean, you could do sudo vi, etc. PSSWD, and you could edit it. But this is, I mean, this is kind of super dangerous. I really don't recommend it. And I know I sound really cool as like a dual voice robot dude. But I mean, after about 30 seconds, it gets really old. So we're going to go over this again probably a little quicker, uh, hopefully a little better than we did the first time, even though you weren't with me. So let's get right down to it. Uh, first of all, we are going to uh, look at these files. Now, these are the files that these programs that we looked at in the last video, uh, that they write stuff to, right? So we, when you use user add, uh, user del, user mod, uh, the et cetera password, et cetera group, et cetera shadow, and et cetera g shadow, which isn't listed here, uh, that's where the the password and group information goes. Um, I'll explain it here, then we'll go to the command line, etc. Profile is where, you know, what? okay. Uh, while I was prepping to teach this, I was like, Oh, I, I covered like profiles in bash RC in a video not long ago, I'll point to that I'll do the thing where I point up at the screen. I could not find it I searched all over. It turns out that I had just edited the book that I'm going to be releasing soon, a section on uh, bash RC files and profiles and how all that works. So you get the very, very quick version of uh, profiles versus bash RC's interactive shells versus login shells. Uh, but, you know, buy my book when it comes out and, and I go much more into depth. Uh, but there is not a current video on it, which I discovered after far too much searching. All right. Anyway, uh, I'll, I'll talk about bash profile, bash RC, the et cetera profile when we get to the command line. And then don't let me forget about the et cetera scale directory, because that's important too. And then we're going to look at a couple tools. We're going to look at how to manage passwords. Uh, we're going to look at these, which I don't actually don't recommend you use, but these are a way to limit uh, an account, like disable an account if people try to SSH in and they get their password wrong too many times. Uh, these both do the same thing. Uh, Pam Tally 2 is kind of outdated. Uh, fail lock is the new way to do it, but I actually recommend you use fail to ban. We'll talk about that in a second. And then don't let me forget about uh, etc. login.defs either. Okay, I think that's everything. Oh, CH age, which is cool and I've never once used it in production. I feel a little snarky today. I don't know if you've noticed that. Uh, but anyway, so. Um, I'm using Ubuntu and the, the names of the files might be a little bit different depending on what distribution you're using. But like when we look at the pam.d uh, folder, they're gonna be similarly titled. And um, yeah, they're kind of, it's just kind of awkward. So let's go right to the command line. I know I've said we're gonna do that a bunch of times and we will uh, look first at the files that are actually manipulated when you add and modify users. So we're here on Ubuntu and there are two files where user information is stored. Uh, so let's look ls minus l, etc. PASSWD is one file and then ls minus l, etc. Shadow is the other half of this. Now, the deal is you used to have all of the information, in the etc. password file, it used to have username and, and login directory, like your home directory and your shell. Uh, and it also used to have the hashed password stored right in that file. But there's a problem in that people could then ha needed to have full read access to that file. And so they could get your hashed password and just use like rainbow tables or just brute force to figure out what your password was. So there had to be a way to get around that. And the way it was uh, modified is that the actual hashed passwords are stored in etc. shadow, no longer stored in etc. password. Now it's been a long time. It hasn't been like a recent change, uh, but that's why there are two files to store user information. Everything except the password is stored in etc. password. And then the shadow file is only readable by root and, and somebody in the shadow group. Whereas the password file you can see up here is world readable, meaning everybody can read it. So let's look at them real quick uh, because you can actually edit these files directly to change user information instead of using like the user mod tools i highly recommend you don't do that uh, but we could say sudo vi etc passwd and we're going to see this is the file we can make a change and save it even if you do want to manually make a change 
please do not just use VI. I'm going to get out of here carefully because if you make a mistake to the syntax, you could break your system and you wouldn't be able to log in at all. There is a tool called, so sudo VIPW. This is a lot like the VI sudo program to make sure you get the syntax right when you're doing the sudoers file. We have covered that in the past. Um, VIPW does that same thing where it will launch a VI and it will edit it. You don't get the fancy color schemes here because it's not part of our environment when we, uh, anyway, you don't get the fancy color schemes inside VI, but this is uh, now editable. And if we make a change here, it will like proofread it for us. It'll check the syntax to make sure we don't screw up. So let's uh, say uh, instead of, I don't know why we would do this. This is um, every user on our system, including system users and users like S powers here. Uh, I, I guess I should explain a little bit what we're looking at. So this is a multi-field uh, database sort of, and every field is separated by a colon. So S powers is the first field. That's my username. The second field is where the password hash used to be. Now there's just a holder there. It's just a placeholder. They just put a single X in there. This is my user ID. This is my group ID. Uh, this is the groups that I belong to. I'm not sure why there's a bunch of commas after there, but uh, then this is the next field separator. This is my home directory. And then lastly, over here is my login shell, bin bash. Now let's say that I wanted to change my login shell uh, and I didn't want to use user mod. I could say, uh, change this to bin sh and then save it. So it's going to be instantly active because we made the change as soon as we save the file. Now, when we save the file, uh, I didn't actually make a change, but because I changed it and changed it back, it thinks I did. And it says, uh, you, you may need to modify the etc. shadow file for consistency. Now, what that means is, remember the hashed password is stored there. There's also a couple other things. Let's look at it. And we could use just VI, but it gives us the command VIPW dash S will safely using syntax checking let us edit that as well. So sudo VIPW dash S, and this is going to be the etc. shadow file now that we're looking at. And it looks down here. If we look down here, you can see etc. shadow, and it makes a temporary file, and it's going to do like the checking and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but this is where all of the password information is stored. So here, uh, this is the hashed password of my S powers account on this server. Um, you'll see a lot of these don't have a password, like there's just an exclamation there that pretty much means it's disabled, right? All of these just mean that there is no lo login password that you can use to log in as them. Um, but the S powers does. So anyway, if we wanted to make a change here, we could, um, and that's basically the way that you would manually edit them without using just VI or nano. You want to use the VIPW command. Now groups have the same thing. There are, there's a group command or there's a group file, LS minus L, et cetera, group and ls minus l etc g shadow and this is the same exact thing where there's a shadow because technically groups can have passwords associated with them i've never actually seen that used anywhere uh, but for the most part they don't but that's why there is a shadow for the group file as well called g shadow and we can um edit it using the can you guess vi uh gr Vigor, yeah, VIGR does the same thing that VIPW does, but for the group file. So sudo VIGR, and this is going to be the group file. And this is where we could add users to a group. Uh, basically, it's just like a comma separated uh, group. So if I wanted to have um, the no password login group, if I wanted to add somebody to that, I would put comma after it and then the next username. So basically the first field here is the group name. That's why I like down here, you'll see this group is S powers. Now that is my default group. So it didn't actually list me here, uh, but you'll see these are the other groups that I'm in. So Samba share, I am a member of that group. And if we wanted to add somebody else, again, just a comma in that last field, that last field can have as many users in it as we want, each separated by commas. And then, um, I didn't make any changes, so it didn't, you know, it said it's unchanged. But if we wanted to edit the shadow file, we would do the same sort of thing. So that's what those files are, how they're formatted. Again, you shouldn't really set them up using an, a text editor. Generally, you're going to use a tool like user mod if you want to actually go through and do that. Now, the difference between a login shell and an interactive shell is basically when you when you have to type in your username and password, 
that's a login shell. That's how you can recognize it. And if you're on a computer and you just open up a terminal window, like you're already logged into the system, you just go to like the start menu and then like open a terminal and it just pops it up and you're logged in automatically. That's called an interactive shell. And it's not a login shell. You don't have to put in your, your login information to get in. The difference is how things are loaded. So in a login shell, it will load the profile information there's the etc profile file, which has the system wide stuff. Again, it's in the etc folder, so it's system wide. And that's where every user will load everything in there. And then at the end of that, it will load in your personal profile, which is going to be like dot uh, bash underscore profile. It could be named a couple other things, but that's the one they list in the objectives. And then the profile does things like uh, load environment variables, like your path variable. Uh, Whereas an interactive shell doesn't. An interactive shell inherits all that stuff from your initial login shell. So when you log into like a GUI computer, like a Linux installed, you know, operating system, when you initially log in, that's your login shell. And everything else you open, every time you open like an X-term window, that's an interactive shell, but it inherits all that stuff that you your login shell got from the profile. Now, every time you open... Uh, an interactive shell, it does load bash RC from your local directory. And there can be a system wide one too, but it just mentions the dot bash RC file in the objectives. And that is going to be stuff like your personal aliases and, and stuff like that, that you may want to have set, you know, on an, on an interactive shell. Now it's, it's important to note too, though, a login shell, generally the last thing your profile does is load bash RC. So it also gets that information, but so the, the, Login shell will get all of the stuff, including your bash RC file, but an interactive shell, again, where if it doesn't ask you for your login and password, will only get that bash RC stuff. It's not going to reload your profile. It inherits all of those environment variables from the initial login shell. Okay, so if you make a change to your environment variables and you just open up a terminal window, it's not going to load in those changes because it's still using the initial environment from your initial login. You actually have to log out and log back in in order to do that. Now, an SSH session where you authenticate is a login shell. So you can actually like SSH to your computer if you want. Anyway, that's the difference there. And that's where those files are stored. The the etc profile is a system wide one. Anything that starts with a dot like dot bash underscore profile, I think they're listed. Uh, dot bash RC, that's going to be in your home folder. Dot bash underscore profile is in your home folder. That's going to be loaded by the system wide etc profile. It will load your bash profile and then your bash profile actually loads the bash RC. So that's that's how those work and, and the specifics there. Ah, now, thank you for reminding me. Uh, the etc scale folder is a folder that uh, you can preload with stuff that you want new accounts to get. Basically, the etc. skeleton folder, etc. scale folder, if you want to have like a desktop folder and a documents folder and you want to have like a shortcut on everybody's desktop when you first create them, basically the system, when you create a new user, will make a copy of the etc. scale folder into wherever their home directory is. So like, you know, home user, and then it will, it'll copy that in all of its contents to this name, and then it will change the ownership to the new user that you just created. Now, it's important to note that that's a great way to get files to uh, like starter files for a new user, but you can't like uh, like load pro or load things to every user after the fact. It only copies stuff over on the creation of that home directory. So if you add something after a user's already created, they're never going to see it. It's only copied over during the creation of that user's home directory. So that's important to know. But if there's stuff that you want to have loaded for every user the first time they log in, that's where you would put it. And that's kind of like the the skeleton of uh, how a, a user's home directory is created. I think, okay, so I think we got all those things covered. Uh, now let's talk about these tools. So I, I don't know what direct, what, what we want to do first, but I guess we can talk about the password command we've, we've looked at and we've used before. That is just where uh, a user, like a non-root user can change their password by typing P-A-S-S-W-D and it'll prompt them for their old password and then the new password twice. And if you're a root user and you type or you type sudo password and then a username. So like as root, you're, you're saying password and then like S powers, you can change a user's password and it will not prompt you for the old password. It'll allow you to change a password by entering a new one twice. So it, it works a little bit different whether you're invoking it as a regular user or as the root user. 
and only a root user can put a username after it and change somebody else's password, which makes sense. Um, CH age. This is a program that allows you to change things that seem really awesome about password. For example, you can change how often a person needs to change their password. That's pretty much what it is. It's the age of the past, like the password aging stuff. The problem is I've never really used this in, in production, although I have accidentally locked myself out of accounts before uh, because they seem cool and fancy, but in practice, I don't know that it's really all that, that usable. So I'll show you how you actually set it up. Uh, but no, it's probably not something you'll ever change on a system. The defaults are pretty, pretty good. So if we just do CH age, and then we'll do dash H for help, you can see the different things that it's going to show. Dash L will list the current settings. So CH age dash L and then the user. S powers is the only user. So we're going to, it'll show us the different things that are set for password uh, rules on our system for this particular user. So it'll say, uh, when was the last pass time the password was changed? May 30th. Uh, when does the password expire? Never. These are the defaults. Uh, inactive, never. Account expires, never. Uh, number of days you have to wait before changing, zero. Number of days before, uh, you know, that you have to, 99999. And then for some reason, they actually set this to a week, number of days of warning before the password expires. So I guess uh, 99,992 days in, it'll start to warn you that your password's going to expire. <laughs> so I, I guess that's okay. Uh, but what the, all these things mean is not entirely clear. And I'm going to use a slide. And to be clear, this is not my slide. I got this slide from computernetworkingnotes.com. I just think they did a good job of it. So basically uh, that first one, the date when the last, when the user last changed their password, like for me, you saw it was, it was May 30th. Um, the minimum days, that's one of the settings. It was set to zero, but once a password is changed, a user cannot change their password until this many days has elapsed. Now, I, I don't know why you would want to do that. I'm sure there's some reasons, but basically if you set this to anything but zero, you change your password, you can't change it again until that many days goes by. Okay. Um, we'll skip over here to uh, the expiration of the password. So this is when the password expires right here. Okay. And um, again, it's 99999 by default. Uh, but anyway, that's, you know, you can set it when it expires. And before then, you'll start to get a warning when you log in it'll say, Hey, your password's going to expire in so many days. Now remember it was set to seven. So seven days before it'll start to warn you. Now, what that means is this period here is like normal operating, right? You can change your password in this, in this time, as long as the minimum days has, you know, elapsed and you haven't, you know, and you're, you're still an active user. Uh, but every time you change the password, this gets moved up. So like, boom, that's the date now. And so if, if minimum days is set, then you won't be able to change it for, you know, X many days again. So that's important to note. This is the part that is super duper confusing though. So this was when the password expires this day. And then the inactive date is in the future. And then there are these things called inactive days. And that is really, a conf I think it's really poor wording right there. Basically what this means is your password has expired, but you can still use it for these inactive days again inactive is terrible i would i would call this like grace period or like grace days or something um you can still log in and you can still change it during this time there's a hard stop at the at the inactive date when your account is inactive and then you just can't log in you can't change your password and administrator is going to have to change your password to get things going for you again and all those can be set with ch age uh, you can do it on the command line for an individual user if you're root so for example, uh, let's say sudo ch age, um, let's change the minimum number of days between password change. So I'm going to, and that is, what is that up here? Min days is dash M. So dash M, we're going to say dash M five for S powers. Okay. And now if we do ch age dash L for list S powers, we're going to see that um, once I change my password, I have to wait five days before I can change it again. So P-A-S-S-W-D, um, I have to type in my current password because I'm invoking this as a user. Uh, so putting in my password, new password. Okay, password updated successfully. Now let me change it again. Okay, it's going to say, what is my current password? Put in what I just changed it to. Oh, 
I must wait longer to change my password. All right. So it's not going to let me change it again, even if I change it to something dumb. So I think that's kind of a weird setting to set, but nonetheless, it is what it is. Now, one last thing about the, the CHH, if you want to make uh, changes system wide, you're going to do that in sudo vi, etc. login.defs is the name of the file. Why it's not conf, I don't know, but it's not. It's login.defs. And here is um, oh, I'd scroll down the last, the first time I tried to do this already, but basically you have to scroll down a ways. There's a whole bunch of like defaults that you can set. And these are the password dates that you can set. This is going to look familiar, right? Nine, 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 nine. That was the max days. Min days was zero. Warning age is seven. Okay. So this is where you can change those system wide. So every time you create a user, these password settings will be set again, just leave the default. It doesn't make any sense to change them unless it does. In which case now you know how to do it. Now, the one last thing we need to cover is Pam Tally 2 and fail lock. Now, Pam Tally 2 was kind of the old way of doing this. It's a it's a Pam, it's right in the name. It's a it's a Pam module that uh, will allow you to set like if somebody logs in and they try to just to log in via SSH and they use a the wrong password X number of times, you're gonna lock their account for a certain amount of time and they won't be able to log in even with the proper password. Um, fail lock is the same thing. So I'm gonna set up fail lock because that's what's on this Ubuntu 2204 system. Uh, but setting them up is similar and kind of a pain in the butt. So you have to actually modify um, some settings or some of your pam.d, uh, your pam configuration files in the etc pam.d folder. So I'll show you what you have to edit and I do not think you'll be expected to remember exactly how to change this. You just need to understand what's going on and where you would need to make changes, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I just became root here, but if we go into et cetera, pam.d, you're gonna see that there are a bunch of files in here. Now we need to edit two of them in order to enable fail lock, uh, which again will determine how many times people can uh, incorrectly log in before they get locked out of the system. So the two that we need to edit are uh, common.account and common.auth. Now they might be different if you're on a different distribution. They may not be called common, they may be called like uh, password-auth or something, but uh, the stuff that we need to edit is gonna be in here. And let's look at them really quickly. So, uh, oh, I'm already root. So vi, common, account, and I actually already pre-filled these in because they are uh, a little bit weird. So down here, I made this little uh, area. You'll see begin fail log crap. <laughs> I called it crap. Um, and in this file, in the common account file, all we need to do is enable the module. So you just basically say account space required space pam underscore fail lock dot so. And that's it. So that file is done. And then inside the common auth is we where we have to add some more complicated stuff. And same thing, and it has to be right in this spot, directly after the um, this uh, auth line here, you have to add an, this right below it before the PAM deny stuff, you have to add the fail lock stuff. And here's where it's kind of complicated auth and then default equals die, PAM fail lock. And then these are the options for that module. Auth fail audit deny equals five. So basically if you, uh, if you fail to log in five times, it's going to lock your account for 900 seconds or 15 minutes. And then same thing down here, sufficient PAM lock. And then these are slightly different, but similar um, things. Auth success, audit, deny five, unlock time equals 900. Okay, so put these in. Again, I don't expect that you'll remember exactly what to type in here. Just know that you have to edit these files uh, in order to get PAM to use fail lock. Now, once it is installed, you don't even have to reboot, right? It's it's in place. So the next time somebody logs in, it's going to be recognized. Okay, so now I'm just a regular user. I'm S powers again. And now um, if we do fail lock dash dash user S powers, we're going to see it doesn't show any logins that I've had and any failures at all. But if I were to do SSH localhost, and then type the wrong password, type the wrong password again, type the wrong password again, so I've done that three times now. I've tried to log in three times and failed. So if we look at a fail lock user S powers, it shows that I've tried to log in and I failed three times. Uh, let's do it one more time. Uh, so this is gonna be the fourth incorrect login, fifth incorrect login. Now my account should be locked, uh, but it's gonna ask me one more time. So sixth one and okay, still can't get in. Let's look and see 
and there are only five because once it hits five, my account is locked. It's it's counting for 15 minutes now, so I can't log in even if I use the right password, which I'll do to prove it. Uh, SSH, localhost, I'll use the correct password, and it just, uh, it fails in the exact same way. Now, what's important to note there is uh, it doesn't say, hey, your account's been locked, and that's on purpose because you don't want people who are trying to like brute force your computer to know when it's they're locked out because they'll just keep trying. And even if they get the correct password, it won't let them in. So they'll think it wasn't their correct password. So that's on purpose. Uh, but let's say you get locked out and you need to get back in. Well, you can, the root user can reset the settings. So if we're back here and we say sudo fail lock. Now I could do dash dash user s powers reset. Um, oops, dash dash reset. And that will reset for just Sean Powers or just for me. And we can do fail lock user as powers and see they're all gone now. If you wanted to do all users on the system, you could do sudo fail lock, just reset without specifying a user. And that's going to reset all of the of the fail lock lockouts that happen to be on the system. It actually erases all of the failed attempts too. So, you know, instead of having five failed attempts, I now have zero. So that's how you can do it. But again, I kind of recommend you use fail to ban, which is software that does the same thing, but it also does it for other programs as well. It can lock out like if you're doing like web authentication and you fail so many times, it can lock you out there, FTP logins, that kind of stuff too. So anyway, this works and it is like at the at the PAM level. So I get why they mention it and I get why it's available, uh, but I have I don't use it very often. Oft. I've, I've never used it in production. I've played with it a little bit, kind of like we did just now, uh, but that's about it. Now, if your computer doesn't have fail lock, it probably has PAM tally two and it, same kind of configuration. You'll have to get the exact configuration for your PAM files, but it works pretty much the exact same way. Um, and that's about it. It was kind of a weird video and this is now the second time I've done it and looking, it's taken almost the exact amount of time. So anyway, um, I hope that this time was better for you than it was for, now, I don't know. I hope this was helpful. <laughs> Remember to learn everything, do what you love, and most importantly, be kind. I'll see you in the next video. Hopefully it won't be this one over again.